All right. So I had an opportunity to meet some of you as you came in, and I just wanted to know like the kind of roles that we have here uh, here in the room because this is something for us to interact with, uh, have a conversation. Because every role has its challenges, every role has its need, every role changes over time. Okay, every role, depending on what hospital I'm in, is going to have different requirements. All right, and it's important for us, regardless if we're the new guy, regardless if we're the equity employee who's been there for years, regardless if we're the manager, we need to be able to identify those needs and fulfill those needs. Okay, and determine what kind of team. Please see. So, first off, I said this might happen. I'm not this guy. <laughs> okay. Ever since the new Star Wars came out, the new episode, everybody says, hey, you look like that guy. I'm not that guy. For those of you who actually watched the series. I am this guy. Uh, 24 years of clinical engineering experience. I've been in small hospitals, big hospitals, in-house, outhouse, vendor, okay? The whole thing. Um, I've been a tech, I've been a manager, supervisor, senior tech director. I do cybersecurity, capital asset management. And I, one of my favorite things is actually presenting. 12 years as an Army veteran, just got an opportunity to share my story there and why I didn't go for the full 20. 11 years of management experience between the United States Army and CDC, civil engineering. And I'm currently with the University of Chicago uh, as the system director over a few hospitals. So, what do I know about building the team? Well, it's actually over my career, I can look into the past and see what my strengths were, okay? I actually was a really good technician, and I don't know why, I don't know how. I actually joined the United States Army because I was at Ohio State University studying criminal justice to be an FBI agent. And I joined the Army. Well, actually, I went to join the Marines first because that's where my grandfather was. They were closed. And the Army guy said, hey, come and wait over here. I walked in, took, you know, got signed up for the ASVAB, took that, said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't care. I just want the federal service. I said, we can make you a bio. Went through DOD over there at Shepherd Air Force Base, graduated uh, my class at that point. Actually, I had a talent. And what my talent was, was fixing the things. And it didn't take me long as a technician as I, you know, poured myself into it to realize that I could fix more than just equipment. I could fix policy, I could fix people, I could fix workflow. Because I had the tenacity of a technician that I wanted to take the ball all the way. Okay, I wasn't just, and we hear it, the, the, I checked the box. Why do you do safety? You know, why do you do electrical safety? Why did it fail? Do you truly understand it? I poured myself into things and had the same understanding of team building and creating things that I did as a technician. So I was very good. What I do is I handle difficult customers. I handle difficult sites that are having problems. They put me there so I can turn them around. It is what I do and it's what I love. Okay. I've turned around small hospitals like Copley Hospital. I've turned around large university hospitals like Rush University in Chicago. Turned around military sites. And currently, after walking into the University of Chicago in 2021 with TriMedics into a shop that was at a 30% engagement score. In one year, we raised those technicians to 92%. Just because we knew how to provide them with what they needed, how to listen and say, What do you need? And finally, 
on the personal side, my beautiful wife there, got married 12 years ago, and both of us wanted a huge family. Well, I already brought luggage with me, I had my daughter, Emily, and unfortunately, we were faced with obstacles. It wasn't going to be as easy as what we had wanted to have a large family. So my wife and I put the same tenacity to building a family that we do to putting a team in understanding, and we started an adoption process. Not only did we start adopting children, but we also decided that we would not only adopt the children, we would adopt their families. We would treat it like it was marriage because they were just grandmothers. They had needs that we needed to make sure we were going to fulfill. So two children later, this is Charlotte. She's from North Carolina or South Carolina. I don't know Charlotte's in North Carolina. Okay. And this is Owen. He was born in the Pizza Hut parking lot in India. Yeah, I would say he comes with side rest, uh, residence. These two guys changed our lives. Okay. And in two weeks, I'll be returning to Florida to adopt my third child, my third adopted child, fourth child, uh, Xavier, who's going to be born on the 21st. My second son. So, throughout my life, I have built the team that I want. Actually, if you guys, uh, Hugh Jackman, the circus movie that he did, The Million Dreams, you know, I close my eyes and I see the world that I can look at and be. That's my wife and my theme song. We will build what we want. So, as leaders and as technicians, you have that. Power, you have that ability. Opportunity is not guaranteed, but if you don't have hard work and dedication, then it won't happen. Okay? So, this is kind of the part where I get a little weird. <laughs> I always talk about you guys ever hear the term drink the Kool Aid? You know, just drink the Kool Aid, right? Well, I agree with that, but there's a difference. I make the Kool Aid. Okay. So I got a little guy on, and I got the call, and what he wants to have for daycare. Owen's doing this, he's pushing so and so. Right? And I thought, how can I get Owen in the best mood before he goes to school? Because I'm the one who drops him off, right? To make sure that he's going to have a great day. And then I thought, this really applies to work. How can I make sure that I'm in the best mood so when I get to work, I'm going to have the most impact? So my son and I had this ritual on our way to school. It is a five-minute drive, okay, to his day here where I drop him off, that we always listen to the same song. And we blast it and we drop the windows and we jam it. Okay, and I don't care who's looking at me. Me and my guy were dancing it up. And he arrives to school in the greatest mood. He calls it the happy song. Okay? And I am ready to do my job. All right? So I'm going to share that with you guys today. We're all going to rise up. And I'm going to play this song. I don't care if you sing along. I don't care if you bebop. I just want you to feel this. And I want them to hear it because I know Brian is over there getting his presentation about social media. <laughs> 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 I told him I was going to interrupt you. So, if you guys would please rise up with me, and I want to share. And, and there's a reason I picked this song and why it puts so much energy in me and my son. <laughs> All right, here, at least clap your hands. Let's give it that. I got that sunshine in my pocket, got that good sun in my feet. I did not do and I love looking in the rear view mirror and see that little guy. Oh, giving back and forth. People in the car see me jamming out. 
and just wonder, right? We drive by the bus stop and everyone see us ready. All right. All right. I appreciate it, guys. But the thing is, sometimes I need that song. Sometimes I need that song because I owe my employees to be this all the time. Okay, and I have my problems. I have my difficulties with time. I love it. All right, but I have to be able to reset myself at a given, any given time to be this guy all the time for my employees because I want my staff members to be the guy I need them to be, the guy and girl I need them to be all the time. All the time. Or to feel comfortable enough to come and talk to me and let me know what's up. Why can't you be that person today? Okay. All right. So let's get into it. Team. There's. You know, I came up with this graphic and I, I really didn't like it because it just screams Silicon Valley game. You know, millennial thing. I know I missed it. I'm ass. Okay. So when I thought about team, this was more like it. Okay, the A team. All right. So we're going to come back to the A team as we talk about different roles that we have to fill. But let's first start off with what is a team? Okay, we're talking about forming something. What is a team to you as far as when it comes to work? Maybe they sit next to each other. What's that? Maybe they sit next to each other. They sit to the proximity, right? I always say proximity is important, especially in a world where you have the ability to work 50% from home, okay? Because when you have the ability to work from home, you now have a privilege, okay? You have a privilege to work from home, but you still must accomplish what you're supposed to accomplish. And the problem with not having proper proximity to your team is you will suddenly simplify tasks that should not be simple. I don't understand why they can't get their PM stuff. I'm sending them emails every day telling them their completion rates, right? But are you in the proximity to talk to the leaders and talk to the techs and see the process to really determine a solution? Proximity makes a team. What else? Wait a minute. Um, they don't hate each other. What's that? They don't hate each other. They don't hate each other. They get along. Okay. <laughs> now, I didn't say you gotta like each other. Just so you gotta get along. Okay. Yes. Uh, the ability to share responsibility. Excellent. Their ability to collaborate and share responsibility. A common goal. A common goal. Respect each other. Respect each other. That is so important. Because I come from a role where I respect the rank. That was a difficult conversion for me. Because you respect me because what I'm wearing my collar, you don't question it. Okay? But in the real world, you have to earn respect. From a leadership role, it is my responsibility to earn your trust. It is not indebted to me. But my trust to you is indebted to you. I chose you, I hired you. I have given you trust. The only thing that you can do is remove it. But I can do everything in my power to make you trust me. So, when we talk about team, Webster, I always go to the most basic definition. A team is a number of persons, any number, you can make small, associated together in one work, one activity, one goal. Right? So let's look, what would you guys say are positive attributes of a team? When you think about, I'd like to work on this team, and if you're working with the team that you like to work with, what is it about that team that makes it positive? Communication, good communication. Good communication. Damn, top to bottom, 
Okay? If there is information being put out by the media to the directors and that information is supposed to get to the very, very bottom of the organization, do you have a proper communication plan to make sure that happens? And then, if that bottom has an idea, he'd like to get up to the vice president, does that exist as well? Top to bottom communication. What else? Trust and collaboration. Trust and collaboration. Flexibility. Distribution of workload. But you know what chokes distribution of workload? Empowerment. The idea that I will empower my managers, my manager will empower my text, and my text will empower each other. Right? That's how proper distribution happens. How does that distribution have happen? Well, I don't trust you. I don't think you know. I'm going to secure my job because I don't want you to know how to do this. Right? So, good communication. We nailed it. Focus on goals and results. Very words because it gives me called something that at one time it would get me very worked up. The numbers guy, right? Director is talking to me about my PM completion. He's a numbers guy. That really insulted me as a technician leader, right? My numbers guy. Then I. <laughs> Opened up my database and started running trends and bit of charts and everything else. And I was like, holy crap, I'm a numbers guy. Right? But my comeback to that was, why am I a numbers guy? What do my numbers mean? My, your completion rates, your results that you are required to meet, drill down to patient safety. I'm not a numbers guy because of profit, you know, it works out. I'm a numbers guy because I believe in the patients in the healthcare that we are providing to patients. I believe in the trust that you have been given and the privilege to work on that equipment. So if you're not meeting your results, you're endangering someone. And that is my limits. And I don't approach it from, hey, you know, we talk during the leadership summit about you know, we talk about PM management. Okay, how do you write your PM management policies? All right, because PM management is very easy. All right, it's how you define PM management, CNL, inpatient use, out to vendor. But what is CNL? Can anybody CNL anything? Should you only be a percentage CNL? Can you see an LMRI? <laughs> All right, that's a David Copperfield yeah, website right, right there. <laughs> right? Inpatient use. What should be inpatient use? What's that? Building. Building. ECMO. ECMO, continuous loop use. If I remove that from the patient, they're going to die. Okay? An ultrasound unit is not inpatient use. Yes, that minute that you need to use it, it was being utilized. Okay, but if you would have come back a little while later, it would have been available. Then we write policies that say, okay, we're going to have CNL, we're going to communicate the, to the clinical user, users 30, 60, 90 days. We're going to do that every month. We're going to document that we've looked for this every 30 days. And then at 90 days or two years or whatever your policy states, if you haven't found it, it will be dispositioned. Now, a lot of people look at what I just promised and say, you won't promise. Because it sounds like a good policy, but regulatory is going to come in here and they're going to look. You guys have it documented every 30 days because you've got 200 pumps that were seen out, and that's 200 work orders that had to be documented. And how do you get that to the technician? Right? How do you get that policy and procedure and practice to the technician? Because it looks good on paper. And the answer to that is you lead as a result in goal driven. I created a dashboard, it's dynamic to the tech that when they pull it up on the day, it's going to say you have this many CNLs that have not been updated in the past 30 days. And then I created templates where they can click one button and put 
ISO level documentation to say, I look for the device I didn't find. So it's click, 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 click. So what I did is we gave them accountability. It's easy to look at your technicians and say, do it. It's something else to give them visibility so they can have accountability. And that's making sure that you think through the process. How will I and my technicians deliver on these results? How will I ensure that my site managers can monitor this process? And we've got the tools and informatics to do it. We've got the technology to do it. We just have to make sure we create those resources. Once again, proximity, tell me what you need. Where are you falling short and how can we fix it? Equal contribution, we talked about that. Support for each other. We're not all going to be superheroes all the time. Sometimes we stumble, sometimes we fall, sometimes we make mistakes, sometimes we have a hard time. We need to be there for each other, okay? So if you don't have a lot of PMs, and so-and-so does, but so-and-so's mom just died, we're all gonna get together and we're gonna help, right? That is what makes us a different mentality because we are not siloed, all right? We work as a team. Diversity. You know, when I came on to the University of Chicago, I had 24 employees, they were all male, in the middle of Chicago. I had no black technicians in the middle of Chicago, south side. We added 12 technicians, eight of those were female, created some turnover, sometimes tough love is needed. And now we have a highly diverse shop. And we have a much more engaged and talented shop. I had a, a girl who, who was cleaning the office for me, EBS. She said, five years ago, I got my IT degree. And I've been trying to get a role with clinical engineering here. And it's been five years. They, they just won't allow me because I work for EBS. So I hired her. And I said, I'm going to give you, you know the hospital, you know the procedures. You've got an IT background, I'm going to start you on pumps and get you the experience you've been missing. And today she's my lead tech in my former children's hospital because we gave her that opportunity, we gave her that chance. Okay, larger systems, you have a responsibility to prove it to hire people that need experience, to hire the college graduates, to hire those people that need experience and don't think you're gonna get more than two years out. We have to be a tap into the career field because there are three, you know, three tech shops, two tech shops that do not have the resources and capacity to train a technician. You're the influx of the career. So you have to be okay with that term. Good leadership, organization, high engagement. How do you how do you make sure your employees are engaged? Listen, you're engaged. If you're not engaged, your employees won't be engaged. It's easy. Okay? Meet with them. Take them to lunch. Not all of them. Yeah. But take two or three people to lunch and just sit there and say, listen, what do you need? And then do something about it. Make your managers do something about it. All right? And then repeat the process. That is how you provide engagement. And then finally, having fun. <laughs> having fun, yeah, it's... You know, you can, we do the parties and we do the white elephants and we do all that good stuff, but it's, that's not the day-to-day -day thing, okay? The day-to-day -day thing, you got to be, the, the, okay, you got to come to work and set the atmosphere. Bad news? Okay. Guess what? 
It takes, it, it takes just as good of a leader to lead through the shift going down than it does for success. Okay. And you've got to be the one to set that attitude. Okay. Changes, but like medical engineering, that doesn't change much, right? Every single day. Suddenly, we're, they want us to do commodes, right? I know, guys. Yay, more training, right? Um, but no, it's, leadership will stand up. And, but you guys, from a leadership standpoint, got to lead the way. Your team will reflect what you present. Okay, and it has other other positive things too. I I never I don't have a hiring problem. <clears throat> All right. I have people that want to work for me. I have people waiting in the shadows. When and I have people that come to me and say, "I'd like to work for you, but you, can you guarantee you're going to be there for the next two years?" I'm like, "I can't guarantee that, but I can guarantee you I will meet my managers that I train." Okay, because you know they're they're doing those things. All right, negative. So we've got Thor arguing with the rest of the uh, vendors here. And when I say negative teams, what strikes you as a characteristic of negative team? It makes you feel bad. It makes you not want to go to work. Hostile environment. Hostile environment. Absolutely. What's a hostile environment? Check violations. Or. Yeah. You don't feel safe. Right? You don't feel safe, you don't feel secure, you don't feel supported, you don't feel like you're part of a team. Poor communication will drive a bad team. Okay? And I can be very clear, it's very easy for communications to be taken the wrong way. All right, so I always tell my leaders, you guys gotta be clear. Dale, if you think you're over explaining, you're not. Okay, you have to be very clear to where you get down to the purpose of why you're doing something. If you leave a gray area, if you leave a blank, you should probably question if you should be talking about it at all. Because you leave that blank, the technicians will fill it in. And it will be a different story, right? You need everybody to be on the same agenda. Same agenda. Same agenda, same, agenda, same page. Uh, and that's so important to us right now because if we look at project management, if we look at capital asset management, if we look at cybersecurity, having everybody on the same page taking the same step is extremely okay. Same mission, same goal. Lack of trust. That's horrible in a team. Okay. One of the things that I do when I first come into a shop is I have you up to your desk. You don't have a part in your desk that is just for you. You don't have cables in your desk. You don't have test equipment that's in your desk that's just for you and tools that are there. But how many people do you see that? We always run out of that. I'm sitting at my desk here. Right? And now I'm dealing with an escalation with the VP with parts in somebody's desk the whole time. And you have to trust each other. All right, not taking shortcuts and making bridges to make things work. Handle the problems. Ask the five whys. Why is this happening? Well, why did that happen? Well, why did that happen? Get to a root cause and fix it. Stop creating shortcuts because they never pay off. Avoidance of differences. Lack of accountability. Lack of accountability. This goes on to my leaders. Tough love. I have no problem writing someone up because my write ups have intentions. You are, number one, I've already talked to you. Okay? And now an HR verbal write ups come back to me. To me, they just added another level. I've talked to you. I've talked to you. We've done the five lies. I've identified what's wrong. I've given you opportunity. Now we're going to move 
into a formal counseling situation, right? Because I've been in a situation where a problem employee was handed off to me with no documentation. Guess where I'm at? Square one, right? Where if that employee had been properly documented, I would have had more leverage to make him successful. When you counsel somebody, you counsel for change. I want you to change. I want this behavior to change. This is your opportunity. Now you're going to have three results from that. You're going to see change. That technician, more than any other, will leave on their own account. Or very rarely you have to go through the process. Okay. I know counseling, it takes a lot of time to get an HR involved, they got calibrated. But you generally never have to go that far. Either you're going to apply this pressure for them to leave on their own, or they're going to make a change. And that's what you want. Okay? You owe every other employee the responsibility of you writing that person up. It's just not about you, it's just not about that person. It's every other employee. Because look at any engagement survey. Is everyone held accountable? The only way you can do that is making sure it's not fun, but the process is there for a reason. And the reason is to correct behavior. Okay? Negative competition, low engagement, and then again, no fun. You just don't like coming to work. You don't like doing your thing. Okay, you don't like hanging in the shop with the guys. All right? That's a sign that you have a bad team. Now, typically, teams aren't all those things. Okay, they've got a couple bad things and they can fix. <clears throat> you have to have that complete root cause analysis, that complete plan to fix things. And things don't fix overnight. It takes time. You know, I've had turnover. And unfortunately, I've had turnover, but it's made a better team. Okay, so let's talk about the perfect employee. When I think about the perfect employee, they're dedicated, right? Confident, they know what they're doing. Reliable, I don't have to tell them to do everything. Then I don't have to follow up all the time. Team oriented, independent, self sufficient. They have good integrity. They are self-aware. You know, I don't have to tell them. They know. Hey, man, listen, like, I had a jerk yesterday, Dad. I'm going to go with a lot of guys, right? Because I know. They are positive. They are engaged, etc., etc., etc. Nobody's this. Okay, nobody's this all the time. It doesn't happen. All right, that's it. 40 year old bird. So, if nobody is that, what is the name of the employee? Red Stapler guy. <laughs> Negative employees are unreliable and untrustworthy. Now, there's one word that I want to bring up here consistently. Consistently. Anybody can be late, anybody can have a bad day. When we talk about bad employees, negative employees, toxic employees, we're talking about consistently they are performing in this manner. No result, not result driven. I've got technicians who are incredible repair, incredible repair, but they're poor at documentation and they're poor at PM completion and they're poor at hitting results. If, as a leader, I'm not putting those performance indicators in their face every day, talking about why they're important, then that is not going to change. Okay? But if I am, and we've had that discussion, and I put this on paper, and I give them the tools that they need to do, we're going to go through the counseling process. 
I know I've done everything that I can possibly do. Okay, and I hope will change because you're an incredible repairer. This was me to incredible Bible, right? Lack of confidence or overconfidence. That's my favorite. Overconfidence. Okay, the guy who remembers that. There are those people who lack confidence, and you just need to build them up. You need to give them opportunity, an opportunity to fail. How do I get to where? Oh man, I fail all kinds of times. They wrote really expensive stuff. They a lot of doctors. Make a lot of mistakes. But there are also you've got probably more dangerous than the underconfidence or those who are overconfident. You have to keep them realistic. Okay? Because an overconfidence when I come into your shop and so get a hand, you know, I'm gonna be my man in like one year. I'm gonna be my man in three. I'm gonna go work for Phillips. I, you know, and they're going to start swaying the rest of the team and be like, man, why am I not why am I not that? Right? It can be toxic. So you got to keep an eye out that they are properly confident. Okay, now how do you do that? You give them opportunity. Put them in a realistic situation. Give them the realistic idea what it's to be an engineer. Okay? If they're bullying and harassing, no place for me for this in my organization. Right? You can have a bad day, but if I see your style, is to be bullied and harassing, no place in, in my organization. Protect my employees. They are confrontational. Happens sometimes. I do, every once in a while, I slip up and I'll give the old vendor the, give me your manager, Karen, phone call. Okay. But I also take a moment to stop, reflect, and it's, you know, it's not the only need to send service reps apology emails from myself saying what I would react to. And I just want to apologize. Right? Because I'm pretty hot blooded from, from the old days. And every once in a while it slips out. They will Irish whiskey side. Excuses. Now I'm not saying you can't have an excuse back in the military days, you know, no no excuses to yourself. No. You can have excuses, but there's a certain point where the excuses went there. Okay, and one of my favorite things, and this is how I see a good employee too, is are you going to make, bring me problems? I enjoy that. But are you also going to bring me solutions? Hey, I noticed this, this is a problem, but this is what we can do, right? That's the difference between just being an employee and being a good employee. Now, will your solutions always get chosen? Will people always take you seriously? No, not at all. Opportunity is not guaranteed. But you want to be the right person at the right time, say the right thing when that opportunity does show up. Okay? And that's why you should bring those solutions forward. Does not follow company policies, blue morale, gossips, does not follow direction, and not open to change. Now, Here's the thing. Anybody got any? I hope not. Anybody got any? Will use all of these? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> they exist. They're like they're like legends within a career, right? But the focus that I want to have with you guys now, all together, if with consistency, you're going to be able to tell. I'm just going to go. Um, you're going to be able to tell. Are they a toxic employee or do they need attention? Okay. Do they need you to counsel them? Do they need intervention to where you need to look at what they're assigned? Maybe they're doing the wrong thing. Maybe you haven't properly evaluated their strengths, but you have to go through the process. And eventually, we hope for change or just another place for you. Okay. And you can sleep well at night knowing you did everything possible. All right, so back to our A team. So let's talk about our roles. New guy, interns, entry level to mid level technicians. Okay, unfortunately, you guys don't have a lot of equity. All right, you're new, you're learning, 
and there are guys around who's got more experience than you. All right? Those guys are long-term equity employees, mid to senior level technicians. Okay? These guys have equity. They put in time with the company, and that means something. Doesn't mean everything, but it means something. Okay? In management, we need to take that into consideration. Because, yeah, you know, we get another big recall, 2,000 bumps, and my equity employees know where to hide. Okay? Here's the thing when you talk to them, don't be like, man, you're lazy. No, man, listen, I know you've been through this like two or three times before, and I really appreciate that you're still bringing it to the floor, even though it's just a moment. Right? So the kids are excited because it's working. To us, senior engineers, it's like, here we go again. Right? So you really got to respect those guys for bringing the tenacity that they do bring to the table time and time again. And you need to take that equity into consideration. Management. I uh, made Mr. T my manager. Managers, supervisors, lead techs, and then finally, our senior managers, directors, and vice presidents. So let's talk about the new guy. Their role, if we're wondering, like, what should I do as a new guy? How do I become professional? How do I become successful over one to two years as I make my way to be that too? Develop time management, okay? Learn priority, okay? Time management and priority. They go to Google, look it up. Okay, email. How to manage your emails. Right now, you get 30, 40 emails a day. It's easy. I can buy them. Okay, I have an email technique that I use that leaves me at zero emails every single day. That is the only way I can manage my email. My wife will tell me. Yeah, you know, I'll come home and be grouchy. You can go and take your I'll tell you right now. Okay? But I developed that myself. Okay? I saw a need to manage my emails properly because I was missing things. Right? And I developed my own thing to manage my emails. Now, I never miss an email. I will respond to you guaranteed within two days. Okay? If it's a large project, you'll get something back for me in two days. Okay, typically a medium. Take notes. Take notes. Gather information. Understand. Absorb. Okay? Network. Come to things like this. The more people you know, you know, that I was, I am a Ben Singh like fangirl. Okay? Ben Singh was giving classes like this when I was a brand new technician back in the morning. So he's like my to me. And I would always come to these events and want to learn more and more and more. Be on the internet and work with the senior techs and want to learn more. Listen more than you talk. Okay? Listen more than you talk. Because it will give your words more meaning. Okay? Get to know your resources. Understand your job and goals. Your job and goals is not what you say they are, it's what I say they are. I need the cool data. Okay? If you're trying to be promoted, if you're trying to do well in your reviews, how could you not know what my expectations are? Okay, when we sit down and leaders, performance goals, development goals. They need to be precise, they need to be measurable. You need to communicate your expectations to the technicians specifically so they can fulfill their, your need. Understand your managers and your teammates. Read the room. Don't think you're coming in to change things. Okay? And I don't mean that you can't have ideas. I've changed a lot. I'm a disruptor. Okay? But I also don't come into your organization saying, I'm going to change everything. I take the time to write it out to see what is the organization, what is the place, how can I make change. 
before I hit him with the title game. Did I learn to do the role first exactly as it was given to you? 100% make the change. And to any notes, remember, new guy, right? Yeah. Okay. When I'm the new guy, I'm talking less, I'm listening, I'm watching, I'm taking notes, but that doesn't seem right, right? But I'm not stirring the pot yet. I'm figuring out who everybody is, who, who are my go-tos, how can I really have change? 30, 60, 90 day plans, right? Those are the things that we have to be able to develop and that's how we go. What they need, what do we need to give them? Direction, resources, that is my job as a director. I am supposed to give you resources. I am supposed to connect with the vendors. I am supposed to go out with the businesses. I am supposed to work with the hospital administrative staff to give you what you need. You communicate to me that you have a need, I fulfill it. That's it. All right, you have to provide every day, don't stop. Give technicians resources. Give your managers resources. They may not use them, but you've given them something. Communication, positive reinforcement, interaction, training and mentorship. Okay? Uh, we talked about proximity. Proximity is important. Proximity gets hard. But you need to make the proper decisions. Maybe me going to the hospital <coughs> on Thursday is going to put me a little bit behind, but the importance of me being there in proximity and talking to the people is actually a very good investment in time and engagement. Okay. So let's talk about the long-term guy. Their role is to sustain the results. You've got the experience. You know how to sustain the growth results. Continuous improvement, upward management, for the longest time at Rush Cotway, I was, or sorry, at Rush University, I was managing my director. Okay, it happens, but it was for the better of the company. Okay, as technicians, as senior technicians, help your managers. Okay, talk to them, respect them, but talk to them. Give them feedback. Don't just let them swing. Okay, even as a vice president was well, a director, I have to up manage my vice president. He's a great guy. Okay? He's really good at what he does. But every once in a while, you need to tell him, hey, that's up. Right? We depend on that. You depend on that. Your lower technicians up managing. Okay? And that's the life. Some people don't like being man. Okay? But you can do it in a tactful way. You no. Know, I know I could have an all out yell out, you know, a, 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 a yell match with my director in his office with the door closed, us level one out our points of view, and we could walk out of that office fully met. Okay, it was our way of communication, uh, but we never did it in front of the test. <laughs> so discover how you can communicate with that management, but look at how you can manage up. Look at how you can get more message heard, okay? Because it, it works, it absolutely works. Uh, mentorship, you know, mentor those younger technicians, experience and governance and workflow. That's a fancy way of saying no hospital politics, okay? You have the experience, you know who to talk to, okay? You wanna get something done? Now, it's not the manager, it's that administrative assistant sitting in front. She freaking runs the place, right? So you bring that experience as a senior tech. So share it with the group. Customer relations and cultivation, positive attitude, drink the Kool-Aid, maintain professionalism. You know, if you see something dysfunction starting to erupt, handle it. You carry quite a bit of respect to a point, and then pull the manager in and leave, right? I thought here. Preserve the culture. Once you've got the family life, you know, it's, it's up to you to preserve it. I'm telling you, the new, the new employees are going to come and go. The new employees are going to come and go. It's okay. It's okay. 
It's not a career here for them, but it is for you. Protect the culture. You've worked hard to develop it. Protect it. You know, identify things, manage up. Listen, you know, this guy is, you know, I've tried to talk to him. We need to do something about us. You know, the team, you know, just like, right? What they need, support, always, compensation and recognition at this level. Okay, they need to be properly compensated and properly recognized for what they do. Don't just assume and expect them to do the things they're doing. Recognize them. And make sure that you're properly paying them and not hiring on new staff at higher rates that would set these guys off. All right. I always say, as I control the budget, I always budget for promotion. If you're eligible in time for promotion, I budget it. It's in my budget. It is the manager's role to look at your performance if you perform. So I always have tons of money left over because performance and development goals didn't reach what were required, but the time goals were. Because I will never have somebody perform and do what I expect them to do and then not promote them because I didn't plan for the budget. Provide resources, resources of voice and decision making at this level. If you're interviewing, if you're looking at changing some major workflows, switching to CMMS, you should have your legacy guys in there with you having a conversation. Remember what I said, they know the politics, they know the history, they are your subject matter experts. Even for technical leaders like me, I still pull the guys in. Okay, and if you look at engagement scores, what's one of the questions? Do you feel like you're involved in decision making? And then finally, honesty and transparency is what they need. Okay, let them in, let them in. I see so many things being covered up and not shared with staff, which becomes an issue. Okay, it's really silly. I'm way more transparent. Finally, Mr. T, I want to speed this up a little bit. Manager, what is your role? It is to drive those results. Technicians perform two results. Managers drive results. Continuous improvement plan. Okay, hey guys, we're having a little problem with the battery storage area. It's always always a mess, so we're going to develop a plan to fix that. And I want you guys to implement. It. But he develops the plan. The director walks in and says, "Fix it." Right? Upward management for me. You know, I always in my one on ones with my managers with, with what can I do better for you? So tell me how to improve myself. Provide recognition, recognition and accountability to all the techs, mentorship, cultivation of customer relations and employee engagement, getting out there, talking to the clinical staff. You know, if your technician is having a problem with a clinical staff member, go be their representative. Show your technician that you have their back. Okay. Drive operations, develop and protect the atmosphere, maintain the professionalism in the shop, develop and protect culture. Here you are responsible for developing the culture in the shop. Okay, you develop that culture. You own that shop. As a manager, it was my shop, right? It was my shop. We did things my way. And I took personal responsibility of the shop and the technician said. <laughs> Develop and provide resources. What do my managers need? They need support, compensation and recognition, communication, resources, a voice in decision making as well. Okay. They need honesty and transparency, and finally, they need mentorship and trust. Okay, so I need to empower them to do what I need them to do. Then finally, senior leadership, our role is strategic planning, okay, the five-year plan. All right, we have to look at things and look at them long-term and then look at your career and look at everything and how we're going to support the hospital. 
manage and employ development plans, resource cultivation and alignment, organizational structure balance, mentorships, expectation of customer relations, on and on and on. Okay, I'm gonna go with all those, we're running out of time. But that is what diplomacy, diplomacy and ensuring that my shop has diplomacy. I am going to hear the voice of everyone in my shop, equally. All right, so quick survey. When does this one end? Just out of curiosity. What's that? 45, I got four minutes. Okay. Uh, let's do the survey. All right, guys. So when it comes down, and I can put these final slides up here pretty quickly with four minutes. There, I, the, the last class I gave at MD Expo was a question of what my two year old talked about being a manager, right? And what I did is I compared the different roles uh, to members of the family. The new guy was like the new guy to the family. Okay, it wasn't a child, I can stay away from that. Uh, but it was new. He might have been like the brother in law, he might have been just new to the family, right? The senior tech and the legacy employees, they were kind of the older siblings. You know, they knew what was going on, didn't have to like them, but you had to respect them, right? How many times do we tell our kids, you don't have to like each other, just love each other, right? <laughs> so then the management was the parents, right? And why that's significant is because as a parent, we have unconditional love for our children. All right, we talked about, hey, when I hired you, you got trust, right? I trust you to do this job. And unconditional love means that I'm going to recognize you and reward you and provide you with training and education and try to make you the best person I can make you. But sometimes that comes with punishment. Sometimes that comes with hard love. Because if we just let our kids do whatever they want, we'd have a couple of jerks, right? But as a manager, that love and passion for me to develop you into the best technician that you're going to be means that I have to counsel. Okay, I want to provide whatever that stimulation is, no matter how many times I have to provide it to change your activity to change what you're doing okay so that is love okay that is being a fan and then finally the director gets to be the patriarch which means like the grandfather i just come in not the not the guy so but i just get to come in and, and kind of screw with the text a little bit get them all riled up and then, then look at the manager and say hey but, <laughs> right? uh, but we set the values of the family. This is something, and we treat it like it is our legacy, like we have ownership of it, like they are our children, like you are our grandchildren, like you are family. And even though our, you know, our paths may split in other directions. We're, you know, we do care about each other. So that's important. Um, I'll wrap it up there just to try to stay on point. Close. 